Welcome to Engaging Culture, a podcast presented by Bridgeway Christian Church. I'm Brian Kiley. Today, Pastor Lance Hahn and I are joined by Pastor Matthew Oliver, senior pastor of the Family Church in Roseville and owner of the House of Oliver, a wine bar in Granite Bay. We'll be talking with him today about how Christians can take risks and engage the culture around us in a way that really makes a difference. That's what we've got for you on this episode of Engaging Culture. Well, hello and welcome to season three, episode eight of the Engaging Culture Podcast. Brian Kiley joined by Pastor Lance Hahn. I am always here. Always here. Yes, and, and I wore a tie today. He, in case you're only listening to the podcast later, Lance is wearing a tie, which yes. frankly, I saw it and I figured we were all in trouble today or something, <laughs> that there was like some yeah. sort of... There's something went wrong. Yes. But, yes. But now that I know that Pastor Matthew Oliver is wearing a suit jacket and looking very stunning, I would I would add. Yes. Uh, I feel much better now. Yes. Joined by Matthew Oliver, yeah. who's Thank looking you fresh guys. today. Very honored to be here, but I do have some bad news. That yes. tie needs some help. Oh, <laughs> Just, you don't like it? I Well, we, we'll have discussions. Okay, great. Fantastic. It's not like it's going to go on recording later on. You know, at least it's, a, at least it's a skinnier tie. So it's like we're working like, this is progress. This is gross. So I'm, I think he's taking looking. it back a Very couple stunning. Years. I would, I would yeah, no, that's I correct. I'll be honest. Uh, that's I correct. am a minister of the gospel of yeah. Jesus Christ. I believe that. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Matthew, I know that Lance and I have really been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, you do some really cool stuff and just in different ways that you and your church and just you personally seek to engage the culture around us, which we thought, hey, that's that would make you a good guest for a podcast called Engaging Culture. So, Except for you're on season three, episode eight. <laughs> it did take us a while so. to get around to it. But, uh, you're hard to get a hold of. If only there was anybody who uh, engaged the culture around us. But If um, only... So, Matthew, for our listeners, yes. can you just tell us a little bit of your story, uh, how long you've been a pastor, and a little bit of your personal background? Yeah, well, I, you know, I tell my church, I tell my family, my friends, I don't know whoever will listen, but I've grown up in church. Um, my dad was a pastor. So, you know, I felt like, and I actually convey, I felt like I was born in a pew somewhere, right. somehow. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a creepy when you think about it too much, so don't. Um <laughs> But I've always loved God. I actually don't have a fall away story. I Amen. Only have a, That's awesome. Yeah, I, I've always loved God, served God, went to Bible school, found the hottest woman in the world, married her, 20 years old, and now here we are. Five years later. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so <laughs> fantastic. You look great. You look great. I think it's odd that all these years later, she's only now 20. <laughs> that, that was a little strange. Yeah, that's awkward. The math never works. It never works. Kingdom economics. Yes. But um, yeah, but here we are. And uh, now we are the senior leaders at the Family Church in Roseville. We've yeah. been the senior leaders at the Family Church uh, for the last, I don't know, seven plus years. Wow. And man... I've probably learned more in the last seven years than I've learned in all the years previous. Yeah. And just realizing what it means to truly be a church, to truly engage the community around us yeah. and uh, shifting my focus, my passions and, or, or shifting is probably the wrong thing, refining them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and uh, we're honored to be able to be in, let's be honest. We do live in one of the most amazing best places in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. 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 No, I'm with you. And you have, because you and I have known each other for quite some time now. A hundred years. A hundred years. <laughs> Which is amazing and since you're only 25. It is. <laughs> and, Don't um, do the math. But knowing you and knowing your passion and knowing what agitates or irritates you or knowing what is important and valuable, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that is still the case, but that's why I love the idea of refining because you are you. And you've continued to be you, but the Lord has guided you through a refining process to where you know how to be more effective or, you know. So you call my wife Lord as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I think everyone should, quite frankly. Yes. Yes. Oh, I was actually speaking of Jesus, but either one, either one will work. Um, I'm just curious, Matthew, could you maybe talk to us a little bit about, about that refining process? Maybe help us understand a little okay. bit of, of how that's worked. Yeah, so it's not... I'm always humbled to talk about where I've come from sure. in this sense. Uh, and it's somewhat embarrassing, to be honest. I, if you look back at some of the photos of me, I'm always embarrassed by every single one of those. Um, I wore that tie once. Oh, <laughs> oh that's so, that's so sad. <laughs> hey, you know what? You were stylish back then. <laughs> well, um, no, I was, I was probably the most dogmatic preacher Christian you've met. I did 
lines really well. I knew I could, I did judgment well. I knew who was saved and who wasn't, just ask me. And I could tell you, yeah, right. I, um, I grew up, I never listened to secular music, didn't watch secular movies. I didn't drink, didn't do anything. I mean, I, I knew what it took to be a Christian by my own standards right? and I did it well. And I held everybody to those. And what God began to show me is his outrageous love for more than just me. Yeah. <laughs> Shocking. Huh? Imagine that. It yeah. was, it was a wild journey. And yeah. so I really feel from where I was to where I am now that I am an awesome bridge to talk to people like me. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of grace for people who don't get it yet. Right. Because I was there. I didn't get it. I I, I could tell you story after story of how I held people to outrageous, ridiculous standards that were never God's standards. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then the breaking down of what God did to me. I, I just said, you know, I never listened to secular music, never, never listened to it. Felt like you shouldn't had all these belief systems. And then God had me open up an all ages music venue where all we had was secular bands coming. Yeah, I remember. (laughs) And it was awesome. The amount of people that we encountered and that got saved and got transformed. And I will tell you, we had a lady, hopefully she's listening now. We had a young lady come to our church two weeks ago. She hasn't been in church in, I don't know, 15 years. And she walked in, she had heard a post that we have done from one of our pastors, Jordan White, had done a post. She said, I need to go to that church. She comes in, she sees me when she walks in and we make eye contact like I know her, but I don't know why. Right. She comes up and meets with me after and she goes, 15 or so years ago, my son came to your church. He called it church, but it was Club Retro. Yep. He died. You did a a funeral service for him at his church, which was Club Rush. That's the only church he went to. That's where he met Jesus. That's where he got saved. That's where his life got impacted. And when he passed away and he knew he was going, that's where he wanted to have his funeral. And she goes, that changed my life. Wow. Mm. Wow. 15 years, you know, just doing something that I never would have done because it was so outside my box. Right. Yeah. Well, well, and what I think is really, really neat about just something you said a minute ago is how, okay, so you came out of this more, not to put origin in your mouth, but a little more legalistic approach to faith, Absolutely. I think would be, would be fair, Absolutely. right? And, and we're going to get into now sort of just your heart for those who are far from God and, and all of that sure. and, and the grace that you have for them. But then also to flip that around and say, okay, I, I think a lot of people that have that heart for the unsaved tend to be a little more judgmental towards the legalistic types, sure. ironically, sure. judging the judging the judgmental people, as uh, John Acuff likes to say, but that you've managed to, and that God's done a work in you where you're saying, you know, I have a big heart for those who, who don't know anything, who are far sure. from God, and at the same time, willing to extend that same grace to those who need the refining process that, that you've gone through. And sure. I mean, hey, I, I had my moment where I threw out all my secular CDs. I remember doing that, you know, so I Did have that in my background. Did you burn them in a <laughs> barrel at a youth service? I wasn't that saved. Okay. I was only saved right. enough You're to throw them out. in my parents' trash can. Okay. So, you okay. know, so that's something. But so anyway, all that to say, like, I have that in my sure. story as well. But to see that you've managed, that, that God has done that work in you, where you have a heart to see kind of both sides of that equation experience God's grace. I think that's really cool. And that's, that's yeah, really well, one of the things that it, that it reminds me of is that Jesus would have these meals with Pharisees and then with sinners and tax collectors. Like those are those are two different, very, very different groups. But he still had dinner with both of them. Yeah. And yeah. so, I, I, you know, because, you know, it's the same idea of the, the prodigal son story, right? You got two different, you got the older brother who's much more pharisaical and the good guy. And then you have the other brother who screwed up and did all kinds of chaotic stuff. Yeah. And the father loves them both. How know? come I feel like both of them? At the same time. <laughs> well, I actually have your yeah. face in my Bible as both of them. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what day is it? Which character right. in this story am I? Yeah, yeah, sometimes no, I even I feel, feel like the that. dad. It's weird. Yeah, it I've is. got it all going on. Multiple so true. personalities yeah. we'll oh, talk about later. Yeah, Different funny. podcasts. So, so tell us a little bit, just for those who haven't been, tell us a little bit about the family church. How would you describe the environment and kind of your core values? Okay. Can I say it without offending anybody? Probably no. not, but that's okay. the fun of it. Uh, okay, no. Okay. Just making sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. here's the deal. You know, I went to school. I went to Bible college in the South, the deep South. Wow. Where you had, you were not saved if you didn't bring a hanky to church and wave it around mm. at least twice during the sermon. Obviously. Yeah. Well, that's very important. <laughs> so we require hankies at the family. <laughs> no. Um, no, I think one of the things I value about this region is we are gifted and blessed with some of the best teachers that you can find. Right, right. Brilliant 
teachers, but when I need preaching, yep, where do you go? Right. Like, and, and somebody asked me, I said, what do you mean the difference between preaching and teaching? I said, well, teaching is really good because it educates you and gives you revelation of the mind. Yes. Preaching does something where it transcends and it hits your heart. Mm. And, and there's such a power it infuses into the very core of who you are. I find that family, one, my style Mm-hmm. My, my presentation, I'm a preacher. I love the word. I love an understanding of the Bible. Right. I dig big into to scripture and exegete scripture all the time. But I love a good preaching. I mm-hmm. mean, I just want to get excited about Jesus. So one at family, we're a little more, somebody said, oh, are you charismatic? I said, we're rowdy. Does that count? <laughs> what's, I don't even know anymore what's charismatic, right. but, but we're rowdy. Uh, we're, we're passionate. Um, we're, we have a statement where it says everyone everywhere. So everyone is welcome. The difference I think is, is most churches would say everyone's welcome. Our deal is, is that even once we get to know you, you're still welcome. Right. We're That's not good. going to disqualify you because most people already feel disqualified. So we don't have a list of no's. We don't have a list of don'ts. We have a lot of yeses. Yeah, mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's just the character of who we are. Right. Um, and even though I'm so young and dashing, right. our church is very, we have a very broad range of ages and we're very um, diverse. Uh, there's a lot of so awesome. uh, yeah. character. That's great. With family. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I love very it. Very cool. Now, Sorry. As I said in the beginning, that was fantastic. That was a commercial, by the as, way. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that was great. Yeah, this episode uh, brought to you by jo- the family. Join the family. Yeah. I'm actually leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going there right now. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my church will tell you because they know this God's honest truth. Yeah. I tell people all the time, I said, if I was to go to church somewhere and not have it be family because we're awesome, I would go and listen to Lance any day of the week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. that's there nice. You go. Feeling yeah, the love all the way. You. I love yeah. what you said about teaching versus versus preaching, though, because yeah. I think that is a that is an important distinction that I feel like most good preacher teachers understand and they know where they lean. Sure. And then mm-hmm. also the, the the need to okay, like my natural style is more teaching, sure. so I need to grow in sort of the more emotive. You know, and I've sought to do sought yeah. to do that. Whereas others, all of my videos are online. Yeah, you can there watch you go. Them. I can learn from the Matthew Oliver School of Preaching. <laughs> but 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 I mean, I think to to recognize that and to, and to say, okay, this is where there's strength, and this is where I feel like I can be effective, and to know your sure. style well enough. I mean, I think that's well. Fantastic. I want. I, I mean, I ask this question all the time: Is when's the last time that you felt like jumping up during a sermon and shouting "Amen"? Right. I, I, we had that last week. Like, we get that in our messages. Like, our goal is we want you to get excited, not just about God, but about God in you. Yeah. Yeah, what is good. God doing in your life? And you come in, you've had a tough week. Let's change that. Let's flip the script on that. Let's yeah. get excited about who Jesus is, what he's doing, not just what he did, but what he's doing in your life right now. See, Amen. you get me going. That's good. Woo! You're okay. preaching, man. So Woo! I will say I will say that the African American church historically brilliant. Yeah. Because their whole idea was designed around the idea of I need an escape from normal life. I need to go to church. I need to remember my Jesus and I need to let him soak into every bit and I Very don't want to just do it by myself. I want to do it with you yeah and i want to have not only celebration i want community, community. I want, you know what i mean ding, ding. And, and so anyway I, just if we're going to talk about respect man the african-american church woo, yeah they, they right boy they, they, they get that part that's really sure. good well, and that's where there's something awesome about unity that i think yep. it, we need more back into the church yes we and do and there's something amazing i could sit on a row with someone that i don't agree with their politics i don't agree with their finances i don't yeah. agree with their football team it doesn't matter i could sit on the row with them but when we both shout amen together yes. yeah. we've just come into a place of unity and there's yeah. power right there in That's that right. moment that the enemy hates yeah and man we're like trying to cultivate this like Listen, sometimes the only thing we can agree on today is a hearty amen. Yep, yeah. that's it, you know? man. That's it. And that's enough. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's enough. Man, World that's changing. beautiful. That's yeah, beautiful. So man, good. I love that. That's so good. Now, uh, again, part of the reason we brought you here today is because of your heart to engage culture and your heart to really affect the culture around us in sure. in some positive ways. Can you talk to us a little bit about why engaging the culture is such a passion of yours? And don't say because it was a passion of Jesus. Because... <laughs> Because that's, punch you in the face. that's true, and like we want to make sure resort to violence. that <laughs> right away he resorts to violence. I will I'll turn just both l- cheeks. I'll just look at you judgmentally. Um, <laughs> Good Christian. But so obviously this was 
this was, sure. I mean, read the gospels, clearly is something Jesus was passionate about. So you can speak to that as well, but just talk to us about sort of your own desire. I won't, to I won't talk about culture. Jesus. <laughs> don't, don't. Thank you. Thank goodness. That's a good minister. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I could actually pinpoint the day my life was rocked and God put in my heart a greater passion for my community and, um, and people, people yeah. who weren't me. I, yeah, I think totally. that's the big thing. And I remember we had just started Club Retro, which is an all-ages music venue. This is years ago. And um, I was super excited about getting people saved. Ooh, I'm going to get people saved. Yay. And um, I felt qualified. I've gone to Bible school. I've been trained, prepared, equipped for just such in a moment. And I remember I walked outside of Club Retro. It was one of our first nights. We had a punk band playing inside. And I walk outside, and there's a guy. He has a mohawk with multicolor hair. So already he's a sinner. <laughs> um, he's got a piercing. He's got tattoos. I know. I know. Whoa. And he's smoking a cigarette. Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. So I tucked my polo shirt in as far into my trousers <laughs> as I could. And I pulled that buckle up tight. I cinched it so no yeah. evil yeah. could invade. And I went out to, to lead him to the Lord because that's what I do. That's what right. I've been trained for. And I went in to tell this guy about Jesus. And I told him, you know, three things. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you. And he wants to give you eternal life. This is the core tenets of what we do. And when I told him, you know, Jesus love you, he said, good. My parents love me and I hate him. And I mm. thought, you are truly a sinner, mm. you know, evil. And, uh, and I told him, well, he died on the cross for you. And he said, good. I would have killed him. And I thought, Jesus, you don't want to save this one. Right. <laughs> Let this one go. And, uh, and I said, well, he wants to give you eternal life. And the guy looked at me and it, it changed my whole life because he instantly got serious, looked at me in the eyes and says, what good is eternal life to me right now? Yep. Yeah. Wow. He said, give me something that can change my life today. And I thought, I got nothing. Right. Because all I had been taught was yes. about a Jesus for forever, but just not a Jesus for now. Yep. Yeah. And I had to go on a thing of, wait a second, there's a world out there longing for a Jesus today. Right now. Right now, yep. right now God. Yep. And that messed me up. And so I personally, that guy had more of a desire to encounter God than I did. Hmm. Sitting yep. out there smoking a cigarette with his, you know, dyed mohawk hair and his tattoos. And I went, crud, I, I've devoted my life to it and I've get I've gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. Wow. And from there, my whole world got turned upside down. And I began to realize outside of the church walls, people are desiring, they're desperate for an encounter with God. And I'll say mine at that time, my programs, my my processes, my sermons and my services, they weren't helping that person. Mm -hmm. How do I get that guy? Because yeah. that's the guy Jesus loves that guy so much. Right. That's yeah. Jesus's guy. Yeah. yeah. And and so am I. Yep. But he got me. Yeah. yeah. Right, now, right. Now what about these guys? And and not just sal not just the prayer, not just the salvation, but he really challenged me like, are you willing to just journey forever with that guy? Hmm. Like not just say a prayer, but also Tuesday morning. Right. And, right. and Thursday and when he's having a bad day and when he when he's messing up or where he's getting angry, like forever. Yeah. 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 As a community. And I was like, okay, that's church. That's the yeah. church I want to be. Yeah. So that messed me up. That was the beginning. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Well, and I would even go so far as to say, I mean, that's eternal life, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it, 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 we, we all know this sitting here that eternal life is not for after you die. Like when, when Jesus was asked by the rich young ruler, how do I inherit eternal life? He wasn't asking, how do I go to heaven when I die? Yeah. He was, how do I participate in what you're doing right now? And, and that, and I think that, that story is so powerful because it's so easy to miss yeah. that we get so focused on eternal life means after we die that we forget that no, Jesus has something for us today. Jesus has something for that guy. Jesus has something for the guy that looks as straight laced as you in your polo shirt, but is messed hey, up in hey a thousand now, different hey ways. Now. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that it's for, t it's for tomorrow to be sure, but it's also for today. Well, and that, that that's when, God began to question me. And in fact, even when I became a senior pastor, he asked me questions. He said, what, you know, what do you want to do in Roseville, Rockland, Granite Bay, Loomis, Lincoln, Citrus Heights, Orangevale, like this, the burbs outside of Sacramento. What is your goal? If you could do anything, what would you do? And I was like, I want to see a million people get saved. God was like, oh, that's great. Yeah. He's like, yeah, that does sound yeah, good. Yeah, that'll, yeah, that'll work. Good. So then he asked me like a really irritating question. He's like, so you save people, huh? 
Yeah, that's good. <laughs> like, like in Matt's name, right? And I was like, "Well, come on, God, you, you know what I mean." And he's like, "No, no, no. What are you gonna do?" And I was like, "Okay, yeah. what? Well, I, I get you." So yeah. I'm gonna see people. I want to see a million people get healed. Like, if we do a huge crusade for like you know a couple months, we can get a bunch of people healed. Let's do. He's like, "Ooh, that's good." So you heal people. Mm-hmm. Well, not me per se, <laughs> but he's like, "No, no. What are you gonna do?" And I began to realize so much that I was doing in church was not just to keep people saved, but not just to get people saved, but keep people saved right. until they die. Yeah. Well, that's like horrible. <laughs> like our quickest church remedy program would be get saved now die. <laughs> just death. Yeah. You know, hey, come to this class is where you all baptism? die. Yeah. <laughs> this is life. Trust, Trust us. This is for your own good. We're kidding, everybody. Just so we're this clear. Is the best day you're ever gonna have. <laughs> You're right. Like, okay, now eternal life. Hey, yeah. you Ta-da. made it. But we yeah. spend so much money and time and energy on just maintaining salvation that then God was like, what are you going to do? And that's when he started bringing the scripture where Jesus is like, hey, a new command I give to you, love. And this is what's going to define you, love. Mm-hmm. Wait yeah. a second. That's what I'm called to do. Mm-hmm. I'm called to love outrageously this whole community around me that, let's be honest, the church loves exactly who the church wants to love. Yeah. And totally. we don't love all sorts of people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. And it's super inconvenient. Yeah. Uh-huh. Loving. Yes. Loving the people that we don't want to love is, is yeah, very right? inconvenient. Right. Yep. So, so that encounter with that gentleman started you on a journey that has now led to you starting all sorts of different endeavors to engage the community around us. You already talked a little bit about Club Retro. Sure. Talk to us about some of the other ways that you've th- sought to... So after that encounter, I started drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that tends to happen. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with the Apostle Paul. Very strange. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Uh, no. Um, no, we wanted to... Well, I wanted to find a way to encounter my community yeah. greater. And... Um, for me, you know, I can blame a lot on my wife. She's British. Ah, uh, that is a problem. There you go. And her family is, so her dad is Irish and her mom is Scottish, born uh, from actually the um, Wallace clan. Wow. Yeah. That's wow. Braveheart. Like, yeah. yeah. Blue face. Yeah. Yeah. Take our lives. When she guy. has blue face though, I worry. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so the culture in Europe is quite a bit different, but I found that life happens so much community happens around uh the fellowship table Mm -hmm. and when you gather people together and you're sharing a meal you read scripture so much of the bible happened around food right oh huge our our best parts (laughs) happen around food chick-fil-a typically right (laughs) yes um and so what we wanted to do was we want that moment where we're engaging with our community and celebrating and it so happens that I find that the wine, the food, the fellowship, it absolutely people's walls come down and they're willing to actually have a conversation. Right. So we, about five years, in fact, five years, we just celebrated five years. Oh, we opened uh, House of Oliver, which is a restaurant, was started just as a wine lounge out in Roseville on the border of Granite Bay. And really... Have you ever had God give you an idea that you absolutely know is God, therefore you know there should be absolutely no problem, everyone should buy into it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the best idea like ever. Like he did a mailer to everyone okay. to let them yeah. all know? Yeah. yeah. Hey, I by mean, the that way. That always happens with me. I mean, that's just, I know that everyone's going to be yes. on board. So we're like, we're going to open House of Oliver Wine Lounge. This is the best day ever. Right. And when you say we. My, my wife and I. Okay. And, and we're going to open. It's going to be great. And I say we as the corporate we. We're all doing it. <laughs> Lance, we're together in this yeah. journey. I have not seen one dollar <laughs> from House of Oliver. Neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. At least we're equal partners. Welcome, welcome to the restaurant business. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, we're going to open this. Uh, but other people didn't get the memo. Yeah. They didn't get their mailer. No. And I'll tell you, the price was high. Yeah. Uh, when we opened Club Retro, we had about half the people leave our church. Right. The price was high to reach that Mohawk kid. Yeah. yeah. When we opened House of Oliver, the other half left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just, but I think there was a point where I'm not doing church to be popular or successful. Right. Church is an expression of our life. Yeah. Yeah. House of Oliver was 
man, we're going to love on our community outrageously, whatever the cost. Yeah. And it costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Now, I want to I want to get into some stuff pertaining specifically to House of Oliver, and I'm really curious to hear kind of what you've learned through that experience and everything else. But before we get to so that... So am I. Yeah, <laughs> before we get to that... Talking more broadly about this idea of okay, I want to be a I want to be a positive influence to the culture around me. I want to be someone who can be part of environments where people are gathering and talking and having real conversations. I want to influence sure. people positively. I think if you talk to most Christians, would yes, if, if you'd say to them like, hey, do you want to positively influence the culture around you? Like very few would say no, right? Like I think most would at least be open to the idea, and yet. It's something that we struggle to do. It's, I mean, representing Christ in the midst of our culture is a challenging thing. A lot of us don't know how to do it. A lot of our efforts fail. And I would just be curious to know from you, what are you seeing in the Christian community in terms of how are we getting this wrong? And then how are we getting it right? Oh, man. Um, In an hour or less. I was hoping you would ask that. No. (laughs) Like, first off, yes. Everyone I talk to wants to do it. They just don't want to pay the price. Because the price is this. I'm going to journey with you even though I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. No way. Like people go, I want to engage culture as long as culture changes to the way I believe. It morphs to mine. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so let's be honest. Let's get as real as we can. The -hmm. church is losing right now. Yeah. In America, we're losing. Mm-hmm. Right. The machine of church is losing. The programs, right. the agendas, the, the religious structure is failing. We've we've basically lost millennials, and then we just wrote them off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We lost them, and then now it's their fault. So we write that off. Right. Um, now we're moving on to those next generation. What is it? Generation Z? Yeah. yeah. Generation Z. And we're trying to grab that in hopes that we can keep some level of relevance. Uh, and I was thinking about... In my life, people I've met, the church for years, we want to be relevant, but like dancing wasn't allowed Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. um, certain music wasn't allowed Mm -hmm. or certain hairstyles weren't allowed or certain looks weren't allowed. And the church is always really big at drawing hard lines. And I thought, I wonder how many one dreams we aborted in generations. Like we want to know why we're not doing it. It's because we aborted the dreams of the dancers who could have tra- transformed the, the creative arts. We've aborted the dreams of writers and directors who could have transformed Hollywood. We've aborted the dreams of, of politicians and influencers because what we've said is you either look like us, you either act like us, or you can't be us. Well, the problem is, is you're never going to transform anything if it's stuck within this tight-knit program and machine and let's be honest the machine keeps changing anyway Mm -hmm. like what do we believe today that we're not going to believe tomorrow or what are we fighting for today that really is nonsense that we're not going to be fighting for tomorrow what are the things that we can start doing now and i have found it's the hot button i don't know if it's hot for you guys but (laughs) the whole idea of everybody losing their faith it's this big thing joshua harris i kissed dating goodbye the guy who ruined my whole teenage years yeah Yeah. sorry about that uh you know, walking away from their faith. Well, the reality is they're not walking away from faith. They're walking away from the faith that some of us have, but they're clinging to the faith they have. And the faith they walked away from is this rules, this whole list of no's, can'ts, don'ts, and and rules list, and they're pressing into outrageous love. Well, I'm pro anybody walking away from a, a, a faith that is a list of don'ts. Yeah. And, and control and manipulation and condemnation and guilt and shame. Yeah, walk away from that. Mm-hmm. The problem is the church wants to reach culture, but wants to hold on to manipulation and control. You can't. <laughs> you just can't do it. Yeah. And finally, man, so proud of millennials because my generation didn't do it. What our generation did is we swallowed it, stomached it, and tried to hold on as long as we could without vomiting. The millennials, they've kissed it and they said, no way. Yeah. We're not taking it. We're, this is how irritating millennials are. <laughs> they've walked away from it. They've thumbed their nose at it. And they're still claiming to have all the same rights as Christians who don't get to have as much fun as them. <laughs> right? How irritating. Yeah. And, and so now you even have Christians in the church that have been Christian going, that's not fair. Yeah. yeah. God's not fair. That's how awesome he is. And so if we want to start being relevant, we're going to have to learn how to go I don't even understand you. I don't even agree with you, but man, I love you. 
and figure out that really yeah. well, yeah. fast. Yeah. yeah. Lance, this is obviously, I mean, we're in the thick of this as well. And we're talking about very similar cultural contexts, us both being churches in sure. Roseville that are what, three, four miles apart from each other. And roughly the same size. Roughly <laughs> the same size. <laughs> same thing. And, and I, so I just want to hear from you a little bit. I yeah. mean, what are your reflections on what Matthew says? I know this is something that you've thought about a lot. And this yeah. is something that we wrestle. I mean, this is a very live issue for us yeah. in terms of how do we wrestle with uh, just the variety of interests that we need to serve. How do we help those who have been ingrained in this very system that Matthew is describing while not alienating millennials? How do we welcome in millennials <laughs> without alienating? Yeah. I mean, these are. I don't think there are easy answers to these questions. But but I'd be curious to hear a little bit of, of your thoughts on it. Yeah, the first thing that that comes to my mind is the idea that um, I. I remember the first time, and it was years and years and years ago, um, very early in being a pastor, where I realized there's a big difference between Christianity and church subculture. And when I realized that they're not the same thing, wow. I began to go, oh, shoot. Like, I don't, what do we do with that? Yeah. Um, so, for example, the Bible says nothing about smoking, but church subculture condemned it. And you said, well, why? And they go, and they would make up something like, well, it's either the nicotine somehow is addictive. Well, this is the temple and yeah. take care of the and, temple. And that's the thing. So then it would go to a health issue of take care of your temple. And then it was a potluck with fried chicken. <laughs> and and I, brother. And I remember. Yeah. I remember <laughs> What's the problem there? I remember. <laughs> going, yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, yeah, this is absurd. Um, and then, so for example, now I do believe that the Bible has real lines. I do believe that there's things that God goes, that's not okay. You don't get to do that. But the problem is, is that we have made so many extraneous, stupid rules, and we start fighting about things that don't matter. And I think that the the world, see, being in church used to be cool. It's not cool anymore. And it so, used to be yeah. cool. I was a cool kid once. Uh, no, no, no. Way before late, you, late buddy. News. Way before you. I never felt cool. Uh, yeah. No, if you move to Texas, you'll be cool again. Uh, yeah. um, so the idea of being a part of that community thing was was cool. And so people went there whether they believed it or not. Sure. Yeah. It is not cool. So now no one is willing to receive the garbage. The minute they start hearing some of the stuff that they're going, that's stupid. Yes. They just bail. Yes. Yeah. And so and so for me, I'm, I'm saying, okay, there are certain there are certain lines of things. You don't just go, you know what, buddy? I'm just I'm full of firming to murder. And I just think that as sure. long as you're murdering people, I just want you in the church and you go, okay, well, hold on. Hold on. I'm not going to affirm the murder. I will love the murderer guy and I can walk with him and I can love him, but there are boundaries. But I like how you went full murder because yeah. at family, oh, yeah. we're not big into lines. We're big into no lines, yeah. but I would have come but, in agreement like with that, that line. <laughs> like you found it. No murder. You Everything found our line. Goes. I'm just saying. Yeah. We do. I, I think yes. it's now if you're going to get nitty gritty, but the problem is, is the church yeah. is painted with such fine lines Absolutely. for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think yeah. hijacking for a moment, but sure, we, I went to a, um, one of our pastor's lunches years ago. Yes. And not trying to out us, but I'm going to out us. Yeah. For a moment. Good. And, um, the person who was speaking is not in this area anymore. And, uh, I remember I had major issues cause he said a statement that absolutely grieved my heart. I almost mm. went full Jesus and started flipping tables. <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> if it wasn't for Don Proctor, yes, I would have right. done it, <laughs> but I love that guy just way too yeah, much. That's right. But, um, the guy said the, the guy who was sharing said, listen, we're pastors. We're the most important people the world has. We're not like subway owners. We're pastors. And all of a sudden, I'm like, mm, uh, wait a second. Yeah. Gosh. Like, we have Oops. a subway owner in our church. Like, I'm always jealous of him. Yep. He's encountering so many people. Every day. I feel so small compared to what he's doing. And You're I right. thought, are there really people who believe what he... And the whole room was like, yep, yeah. yep, yep. And I'm like, I'm surrounded by pastors who think... They've got it figured all out. I right. can't be associated with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's been my battle. And I think that's the battle the church mm. thinks they know it. Yeah. yeah. We think lines are no lines. Like yeah. we think we're the coolest kids and we've right. lost the fact that we're not. Yeah. Right. And I mean, just to state the obvious, I mean, what an incredibly demeaning statement. Ugh. Right. And, and I think the, 
And I'll just say, there's some arrogance that comes with that and some extreme naivete to recognize, no, actually, or well, you have to, sorry, you have to not be naive to recognize, no, actually, that subway, they are serving God in ways that the three We're, of us don't get yeah, to. Yeah, we don't get right? to. I mean, I had yeah. my first, my first, my first boss in ministry who was wonderful in a lot of ways when he was trying to get me to come work at his church. I was working like a fleet feet type place at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, you need to stop selling shoes and start serving Jesus. And I'm like, Whoops. dang, like, I guess I took the job, so I managed to swallow that. But that, that for, I mean, here we are 20 years later, and I, well, not twi- quite 20, long time later. And I remember that statement, and I'm just like, no. And I even but had that's, a conversation. That's what we did. We swallowed yeah, it. Yeah. And, 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 and one more thing, and then I'll, I'll stop, is that I had a conversation with a guy in our lobby just this weekend. Good, you know, guy that I chat with on you know pretty regular basis. And he comes up to me, he goes, and, uh, you know, sorry, person who said this to me, that if you talk to me, you might show up on a podcast. That's how it goes. <laughs> just saying. So, I mean. so he just said, I have a question for you. And maybe it's just because I'm in kind of a bad mood today. And this is, again, friendly guy. I'm not, I don't feel threatened by this guy at all. He says, I feel like a big part of my job out in the, out in the world is to like represent Christ to most of my non-Christian coworkers. He's like, so how does that work for you? being in this environment. And we had a great conversation about it. And I totally affirmed the question. And I said to him, same thing I used to tell college students when I was doing college ministry years ago, is I said, listen, you can serve God in your job at an architecture firm just as well as I can serve God in mine. And, and, and I can ignore God in my job just as easily as you can in yours. So I think affirming the value of what people are doing out in the world. If you want to talk about our role as pastors, it's to help people see the extent to which they have the ability to serve God and build the kingdom and be a part of God's creative work in the world, whether they're owning a subway or selling shoes or drawing architecture designs or picking up trash, whatever, to affirm the dignity of that instead of, you know, ah, well, we're not, we're not like those people. We're special. I was in a, I was in a meeting where we were talking about a uh, Christian possibility of a Christian high school. And we were all, they got a bunch of pastors in the room and there was a, a higher education guy in the room. And uh, so we finished having this big meeting about all our ideas and everything. Afterwards, I talked to him and he was discouraged. And I go, I go, what's up? And he goes, you know what? Education, that's my pulpit. You stay in your pulpit. Like, I mean, the whole idea of going, (laughs) dude, you guys are thinking that just because you're pastors, you know Wow. Every area. Yeah. Wow. That's my pulpit. Like, wow. yeah. like you're stepping on my territory. Dang. And I think I know I'm allowed to serve God just as strongly in my pulpit as you are in yours. And it was just, it was this beautiful wow. awareness that he had of going, I fully own where he put Edu- me. Yeah. Right. So anyway, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. And that's what we have the opportunity. I mean, we're getting sidetracked from our original yes. conversation, but I think this is helpful. It's like good. that's, that's part of what, that's the opportunity that we have. And I would say to our listeners, like, I hope that's what you're getting, whether you come to Bridgeway or the family or any other church, that yeah. the dignity of your work is affirmed, that the opportunity Absolutely. you have to well, influence and, and culture then we, is affirmed. The church for years, part of the reason we've missed it in affecting culture is yeah. our answer to it was to create subculture. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's there's education, then we make Christian education. Yep. Oh, there's music, let's you make Christian run away. music. Let's, yeah. There's movies, let's make Christian movies. And let's be honest, we suck. And yeah. I'm sorry. No, if I, I offended that, that, you and you're I listening. Think, think, you do not I, have to go to the family. <laughs> <laughs> Please, in fact, go to Bridgewater. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing offensive here. <laughs> but, you know, and I, I think instead of creating subcultures, see, what Jesus said is, is we're not creating a separate kingdom. He said, my kingdom is invading this yes. earth. Yeah. Right. We should be invading. We yes. should be awesome. And what I'm finding is, is that there are people with great ideas outrageous, offensive dreams. They're offensive to me because their faith is bigger than mine in areas that I don't have faith for. Right, right. It's offensive, it's outrageous, it's irritating, and it's 100% God. And the church for years has said, if it doesn't line up with, like a senior pastor, if it doesn't line up with my vision, then it's division. And it's like, no, 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 how about this? I can't do it for you, but man, I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to grow you. And I'm going to be there with you every step of the way. And you're probably going to mess up a ton. Because I'll tell you, we opened House of Oliver. We messed up a ton. Yeah. Like we figured it out the hard way. Yes. But there's still so many lives that got impacted, so many hearts affected. But you mentioned something earlier about the idea that when we go back in history, there was different seasons where churches were against different things. And when the church was anti-Hollywood, If you were gifted as a screenwriter, where were you supposed to go? You can't stay at the church. 
So you had to go away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you were, yeah. you know, for for whatever it was, if you were um, an MMA fighter and the church just constantly said, well, that, you know, that's Violence. that's wrong. Yeah. And vi- where are you supposed to go? You're no longer allowed there because everyone knows who you are yeah. and you're either going to get heat every day for what you do. So once again, I think that the chasing out of a lot of, as you were saying, God dreams, God talents, yeah. being chased out of the church stopped us from engaging culture appropriately. But here's what happens is I know there's going to be people listening. I know there's going to be people in your church and people out there that they go, but what about For this? Sure. What yeah. about the porn star? What mm-hmm. about the mm-hmm. drug dealer? What right. about where, where do you draw the line? And this is what I tell people out our church. Don't worry about it. Yep. That's not your job. That's not your job. How about you take care of you? Because if you could just. Right. So the Bible calls us to be love. Yeah. It says it's what we're defined. And then it tells us what love is. Yeah. Right. How about just try those couple of items yeah. today, if you could do that, you'll never have time to judge that person next to you. Yeah. Right. Take care of you. Yeah. Love the people around you. You be the change. Because yeah. what I found is when I introduce that person, you might disqualify to Jesus. It's amazing what Jesus can do that you can't do. Yes. He's yeah. more equipped with it. He's got yeah. the answers you don't have. And while you're asking me questions, well, what about the porn star? Jesus is like, bring him on over. Yeah. Right. I deal with this. That's this right. is my expertise. Yeah. Yes. Yep. He's like, I dealt with you. Know that I can <laughs> handle big problems. Yeah. yeah. And and where so where people get caught up in the minutiae and they get caught up in that fine territory, they need to stop. Yes. That's not but but that's also me. I'm not writing a book and I'm not coming out with a major thing. Like I'm not promoting anything. Right. It's fun to promote things that focus on the things that separate us and those fine lines. Totally. Oh, yeah. But that's not what Jesus did. Yeah. So yeah. so here's where things uh, get um, tricky for you, which is they'll say it's one thing to welcome in a bar owner. Ooh. It's another thing to for the pastor to be the bar owner. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And your response would be, Perhaps, and this is what I'm. Gonna, this is what I'm, I need you to answer for you because you're obviously beginning to suggest. Tell that me my response so I know how. To that's answer. what I'm telling you. Please. Oh, I will. I'll write it Pastor, down for you, Reverend. Um, the impression that I get is that you're saying I don't think you're looking at it correctly. There is a different vantage point that we need to be looking at this in, and let me tell you another way to see it. And so what, what is that other way to see it? Because they would say, well, alcohol, you're promoting the drinking of alcohol by selling it I am. and promoting it. <laughs> and then they would Unashamedly, say- Unashamedly, I would- <laughs> Oh, totally. Uh, we have the number one happy hour voted in the region. Right. And <laughs> so they over. would say, aren't you promoting sin? And your mm. response is- <sighs> I know I, you've I, never heard this question yeah, before. Yeah, and, and so. I actually well, really appreciate it. The problem is, is I don't normally get asked it by friends. <laughs> 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 so I could be, I could change. In fact, I had somebody ask me a question the other day. They were at, they were at our restaurant. They were enjoying yeah. a glass of wine. They said, I can, I can have a glass of wine. I have a hard time having a pastor who has a glass of wine. And uh, <laughs> they, they asked me, well, what's your stance on this? And I gave them a response. And they, they looked at me concerned. They go, don't you want me to go to your church? And I said... <laughs> I don't care if you go to my church. <laughs> not now. <I'm> not, <laughs> but like, isn't that weird though for so long? And, and Lance, you know how this goes. Yeah. People think you're going to just pander. Oh yeah. Like welcome, you're trying to win them over. Welcome to the family church where we pander to no one. Oh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> nice tagline. <laughs> um, no. So I think the first thing is uh, on when I'm being sassy yeah. and people go, well, there's a difference, you know, between. Yes. Inviting a bar and owning a bar. There's a difference between making a wine, the fact that Jesus made wine. Not just made wine, the best wine. The good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. But um, that's ridiculous, and I don't want to get too far into that. Um, one, we had an absolute passion to be incorporated into our community. That's the first thing. Yeah. And when we opened House of Oliver, we changed. It was amazing how few non-Christians I knew in life. Oh, absolutely. Before I before I said I'm going to partner with my community. And um it really it, there was a lot of factors involved into it, but we have an amazing I live in an amazing neighborhood. And a little shout out to my neighbors. And um we would have some of the best god times sitting out around a fire pit having a bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. Best god times. Now, 
our church maybe wasn't a fit for him. In fact, they would they would tell me they'd be like, "Why would we go to church? We're having church right now, <laughs> right? And this is great. Like we get I have you a better chair, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's comfier, and we have a fire pit. Um, and we would have great God times. I was like, man, if I could duplicate this moment with my community, right? How awesome would that be? Yeah. And you brought up a good point earlier, talking about not smoking cigarettes and Kentucky Fried Chicken. You didn't say Kentucky Fried Chicken. You said Fried Chicken. Yes. But Let's those leave guys. KFC out of this. <laughs> Poppy, Popeyes. Popeyes. <laughs> yeah, Popeyes. Take throw, them out. Throw some at them. Um, you know, I think that for a lot of people, it's okay. It's, we could talk for ages about what scripture says about alcohol. I'm, I'm very versed in it and I'm equipped for that argument. I don't do it anymore. I don't even give the time and energy to have that argument because I find that it's a waste of time and energy. Most people who want to argue about it, they've made up their mind, they've already determined, and they just want to bait you into some sort of yeah. you know ridiculous right. conversation. But you know, the number one killer in America, you know what it is? Number one killer in America. I do heart, not know. Heart disease? Heart disease. Yeah. Heart disease. Caused by obesity. Number one cause for heart disease is obesity and diabetes. Yep. Yep. Number one effector of families. It's destroyed more families than anything else that takes place in America. Heart disease. But yet, to your point, churches offer donuts oh, almost yeah. every Sunday, and they have cafes with uh, uh, sugary drinks mm -hmm. that are being offered. Yep. I think that one of the disservices that we've done in the church of America is that we have not focused on one of the lesser popular fruits of the spirit called self-control. Right. Mm. This whole idea of, you know, we, we had a horrible moment happen when a song came out about Jesus, take the wheel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't want the wheel. He gave you the wheel. Mm -hmm. He actually said, you get self-control. You get Response, personal responsibility. See, it's one of the things that irritate me about the conservative right religious group in America is we want everybody to have personal responsibility but us. Right. Mm. We don't want to have to take responsibility. So the big thing with drinking is like the big thing with eating. Yeah, don't do too much of it. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to help you in this journey to take responsibility. And there are some people like me who just shouldn't eat a donut. Yeah. So I don't. And I have them in my church every single week. But I have the ability to say, no, it's an amazing gift God gave Shocking. Me. Yeah. yeah. I and thought anything placed before you, you must <laughs> take. <laughs> I've had a hard life. <laughs> yeah. It's very American, though. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well done. And uh, so, you know, what we've tried to do is journey with people. You know, we have an amazing Celebrate Recovery program at our church. And I've been able to walk more people through that program who I'm meeting with or, or, or through various programs like it that I meet at our restaurant and go, you need help. Would you like help? And you know, what's crazy is when their defenses are down, they always say, yes, hmm. I need help. Yeah. Help me. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have answers for that. And I'm not going to leave you because you always know where to find me. I'm not just a fly in by night, you know, day and night pastor. That's just going to, no, I'm in it. You know, they find me <laughs> yeah. and uh, they want to meet with Pastor Oliver. They can go to the restaurant and they're going to find me there most nights and they know how to meet with me. And I've prayed for people with cancer and I've seen, I have the testimonies of people healed, people delivered, people transformed. I've led people to Christ in our restaurant all the time. Not all of them end up at our church because you know what? Our church isn't a fit for everybody. Yeah. We're feisty. But we've seen that transformation happen. But our goal is let's help people with this whole idea of personal responsibility and self-control. Yeah. 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 So centering on that piece, because I think that that is the crux of the matter, because people are going to keep going around and going, well, it's one thing for a pastor to be in a bar. It's another thing to him to own sure. the bar and then serve the drinks and blah, blah, blah. And you go, okay, every time you make that argument, we still missed it. Let's go back in. Amen. You keep telling me that alcohol is a sin. Alcohol is a neutral. How are you going to utilize it? Yeah. And quite frankly, there is one way God designed it to bless – and you keep pointing out the curse. Yeah. And if wow. you keep for by lack of self control, allowing the blessing of God to turn into a curse, doesn't that seem to be your problem? Yeah. So I, you know, once again, I you're think, hired. <laughs> I will take you with me everywhere I go. I will be a waiter. <laughs> well, at house there, there you go. Well, so and I love so Matthew. I was I, I was watching the YouTube video you made a few years ago talking sure. about House House of Oliver, and and I'm not going to get the exact quote just right, but I I love that you, you said basically, you know, people ask you, oh, as an owner of a bar, are you promoting drunkenness? And and you'd said basically, hey, listen, if I opened a cafe, 
nobody would ever accuse me of promoting gluttony. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's almost like we don't. To, to your point about self control, we don't know how to have self control. Or for a lot of us, I think those that are from more maybe more conservative spiritual backgrounds, yeah. uh, which is not me, but I know is a lot of people that's been so ingrained in them from a young age. I'll call the devil. I'll call the devil. I'll call the devil. Granted, it's being told to them by people who are, you know, clearly dealing with the effects of gluttony, but, uh, you know, they're told this. You so it, it gets, yeah, I said it. So it, it, it gets so ingrained that it's hard to think of it in any other way. Sure. But I think that, and, and Lance, you've said this before in discussions of alcohol as well, is that those who enjoy wine, those who enjoy beer, those who enjoy it for what it is, the finer things of life. the finer things of life. They're not someone like you who knows a lot about wine. When you drink wine, you're not thinking, oh, I'm going to get drunk tonight. No, you're, you're thinking I want to enjoy it this ruins it for what it is. Yeah. The idea of, get, of getting drunk would completely ruin it. And I'm going to tell you to get drunk on wine. You really have to work at that. <laughs> <laughs> that takes commitment that, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, um, self control. Yeah. No. But I mean, but then on the flip side, and anytime I talk about alcohol publicly, I'm always careful to say, listen, do I drink? Yes, I do. Am I careful about when I drink and in front of who I drink? Yes, I do. Because I don't want the person who's struggling and who shouldn't be drinking yeah. seeing me and thinking, oh, well, the pastor's drinking, so it must be so okay. So it's funny you bring up that point, though. Yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, I think at another time, even on a personal thing, we can have this conversation because I find that that scripture about not causing your brother to stumble is one of the most misquoted, misunderstood scriptures of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, it's used in a lot of ways it shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. and um, But I never worry if I'm going to eat meat in front of a vegan or if I'm going to eat a donut in front of a person who's on a diet i'm not yeah. like oh man i'm gonna make you struggle but for some reason when we come to alcohol we feel like that's the case yeah that's fair and point. um i actually feel like i mean there's people i have good friends there's times i i abstain and i go through seasons where i'm like man i'm just not i'm not drinking right now i'm fasting i'm doing different things sure. and uh, i have no problem being in the presence or being at my restaurant where people are drinking yeah because again it's still that self-control right yeah. portion that I think when we take someone and we say, let us do our best to take all temptation away from you, what we end up doing is saying, we never want you to get strong in these areas. Mm, we never yeah. want you to grow this muscle of self-control. Yeah, and so then what we end up getting is Christians, you get pastors, you get leaders, you get people involved in church, elders, deacons, what do you guys have? Okay. And um, then all, all of, of a sudden they're weak in this area. Yeah. So the first moment that happens, they fall and we have never equipped them to grow their muscle of self-control. See, that yeah. fruit, the whole idea of fruits, and we've talked, if you did children's ministry, you know, fruits of the Spirit, it grows. It, it's it's not given to you fully developed. Yeah. It's given to you as an opportunity to develop. Yeah. But so much in church, what we do is don't develop it and why. This yeah. goes back to the machine. Church needs control. And we can control, manipulate, shame, condemn, and we use that. So if you can stand on your own, you don't need me anymore. And if you don't need me, what's my value or worth? Yeah. Because we thought church was something you just attend rather than the community and the celebration of life of what happens every day. Yeah, that's good. Many good. times um, avoidance is assumed to be holiness, right? Ooh. Because we always <laughs> think we always think of the Joseph story, right? She came on to him and he left his coat and he ran out the door. Um, I don't always think of that, but now okay. I will. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, but the thing is, is that was a specific situation. Sure. He had told her no for a really, really long time and was in the situation saying, I have a self-control that allows to keep this at bay, yeah. and that is my righteousness. Yeah. At some point, she was going to grab onto him, and there was going to be another altercation. And he said, it's now amping to a level that my righteousness has to take a different means. Yeah. Wow. And then he left. But we really get into this avoidance. Don't do anything because what if something happens? Yeah. And you go, yeah. so you're telling me that you're too weak to walk in yes. a normal way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. And I think that, I mean, you're absolutely right that I think conflating avoidance with holiness is a huge problem. Yeah. And even, you know, as I'm reflecting on what I just said in light of what you said, I think even the fact that I feel the need to put a disclaimer on, hey, let's be careful with it. And there are some of us around here who probably shouldn't be drinking because yeah. it's going to affect us in some negative ways. Like, to the point we were talking about earlier, like I don't really feel the need to say that about donuts and yeah. about prime rib. When frankly, I probably should. You know, more so than al more so than Never alcohol. Never about prime yeah. rib. Yeah. No, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God forbid. But but I think I mean I love the the concept of self control, 
and recognizing it for the gift that it is, that one, when our self-control muscles are strong, wine can be enjoyed without fear. Thank you. Right? Yeah. When yeah. It, and, 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 you know, and, prime donut. rib and donuts and everything else. So anyway, but, go ahead. So, so let me jump to the heart of it as, as we're kind of wrapping this, at least in my opinion, is that we ended up getting into alcohol, but really the whole idea was the House of Oliver was to create an atmosphere where the world would say, this is something that I enjoy. I find it odd that you enjoy it as well as a Christian, but around this table, we can spend time together. Yeah. Yeah. And in that atmosphere of time together is where the magic happens, yep. which is we're being with one another and Jesus is flowing in the believer and therefore it can pour out. And so I, I isn't that truly the heart? So if, if, if I could break it down in this though, that's sure my heart, right? That's, that's on my level, but you sure. know what happened? The bigger thing I put it all on the table and I said, God, I'm going to risk big on you. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to be willing to lose the church right. as a pastor. And and I'll tell you, sermons were preached about me. Leaflets were done. Somebody picketed. All sorts of nonsense yeah. were happening. Okay. I'm going to go through all this because this is so important for me. The bigger thing that happened is, is that as cool, as much as I love House of Oliver, as cool as it is, as the best restaurant in the whole entire region <laughs> that it is, uh, it pales in comparison to the other dreams that were birthed out of our risk. Hmm. We have seen people run for, for office, political offices, and win. That would have never dare step foot. We've seen people join music bands and travel the nation and be elevated into a place where they're speaking into life that never would have happened. Uh, some of you guys know Sammy Cater's a really good friend of mine. He does Sammy Circuit. His hmm. whole thing, he is in hundreds of schools talking to thousands yeah. and thousands of young people every single week. And that was birthed out of the same time I'm going through what I'm doing with house of Oliver wow. and what he's doing. He's impacting multiples of what I'm impacting. Wow. But, Oh, well, you know, if you're not a pastor, you know, this is the most <laughs> important job. No, actually Sammy's job is super important. And the messages that are getting out there, the lives, by dreaming big, risking big, and that's what I love. I started by saying we're losing. Yeah. The church is losing. But actually the kingdom's winning. Yeah. Yeah. There amen. are more people wow. who are realizing I don't have to fall in line with what the church had said and I can still have a relationship with God. Yeah. And we're trying to get those. Hey, let's yeah. journey life together. Man, yeah. that's so good. I want to say something about Sammy Circuit only whoop, because whoop. he came to my kid's school and my kids came home talking about how great it was. And then they have like a family night whenever this happens <laughs> uh -huh, so you, can, uh -huh. you can go. And of course I'm totally out of shape and yeah, they're making this those. exercise, which is really <laughs> irritating, but I'm watching this guy and I'm going, this is unbelievable. This guy is super positive. He's yeah. super affirming. He's got kids moving their bodies, working out. Families are coming together. This is an unbelievable yeah. program. And now to hear that this is a guy that, that you know and that it, this that you've kind of seen this movement. Yeah. Birth. And I, I mean, I said to my wife after we experienced I'm like, every kid needs to experience this. Yeah. This is one of the best programs I have ever seen anywhere. And you know what? It didn't happen in church. No, and you <laughs> and should have okay. that guy on here because yeah. Sammy, there's no one with a bigger heart. Yeah. And he absolutely, he wasn't saved when I met him. He, his whole, he was working at a 24 hour fitness and he got rocked and, and it is awesome to see him. Now he's not the type of Christian most people can handle. <laughs> he, he's got his own walk, his own, his own faith. I mean, he's sure. got his thing going, but I'll tell you what, he's the kind of guy you want out there yeah. leading those kids and speaking yeah. life into him and he's making it happen. Yeah. And he did an unbelievable job in, in, in what we saw. Now I want to ask you real quick, your experience as a restaurant owner, mm -hmm. I'm curious how, how has that helped you understand our culture better? And then how has that affected the way that you approach your life as a pastor? Man, there's, there's so many ways that you can go. I think sure. it's been extremely humbling. I think failing is a value. And I think I've experienced a lot of failures that I didn't experience in church. I think in church, you can create a bubble where you can validate everything and you can quantify everything. And when you fail in church, it's not really failure because it's somebody else's fault and you're able to move forward right. in business. You don't, <laughs> you don't have that luxury yeah. in business. It all falls back on you. And mm. so probably any business person out there would say, uh, you learn so much more in failure sometimes than in success. And I think I had been in a bubble of success in mm. church that 
uh, business taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. Business taught me more about identity and who I am and who I'm supposed to be and how to serve. Like I serve a church. You don't mind, you know, any good pastor, you know how to clean a toilet and mow the lawn and be a janitor because that's where we start. Mm -hmm. But um, as a business owner, you're still <laughs> mowing the lawn and, and cleaning the toilet and, and doing it all. And you're the one serving your community. I love absolutely more than anything, being able to be at the restaurant and take dishes to somebody or clear their plates and realize they don't go to my church. There's no other value, but I'm encountering them and I get to serve them. Mm. It is awesome. Yeah. Man, it changes so my cool. life. So cool. Okay. Lot. I have a last question unless you wanted to work anything in here, here, Lance. So, so my last question for you and then, and then we'll, we'll wrap is, uh, I find your story so so inspiring, just your willingness to take the dream that God put in your heart, to Appreciate deal with the blowback, to deal with the critics, to go through the 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 failures and the challenges, which we, I mean, we've hardly scratched the surface of that sure. stuff, I know. Uh, what would you say to the person who feels, who feels like, man, God, God has put these dreams in my heart of ways I can minister, ways I can affect the kingdom, things I want to do with my life, whether it's, like you said, start a business, join a band, run for office, whatever. The person who feels that, call on their life, but is afraid, is afraid of the blowback, is afraid of the failure, is afraid of the critics. You've lived all yeah. of that. Yeah. What would you say to that person? Man, I would first, I, I, I think go for it, go for it. Yeah. But there is so much power in community and I could not have made it through without the community I was surrounded by. And uh, to be honest, I, I, I laugh that we lost uh, people. Our church made a change. Mm. But in that change, I was surrounded by some of the most amazing, brilliant, big-hearted people. Because there's accountability in there. Yeah. You, can't, you can't negate that. But um, they were just awesome champions of faith yeah. and champions of belief. And I think being a good community, be, if you're not in a community right now, that's going to rally around you, challenge you, like, come sure. on, if you can't have somebody tell you no, everybody <laughs> needs someone in their life who can tell them no, that they listen to. Yeah. And I have those people. Uh, they just were out that day. So <laughs> <laughs> we still did it, but I think go for it. Be in a good community. Yeah. Risk big, dream big. Uh, Nehemiah is one of my favorite books in the Bible and don't, lose sight of the fact of preparation. Um, I say in business, like don't do anything without a killer business plan that's been approved and by a bunch of people. Nehemiah, he had a heart of God. He had the passion. But when the king turned to him and said, hey, what is it you want? He unlaid a full plan that he had yep. spent time and energy preparing for that then created that opportunity for victory and success in his life. Yeah. It's almost like the emphasis, and I think this is a very American thing and, and sort of a, a church thing as well, but we've placed so much emphasis on the individual and my dreams and what I'm going to do mm. that, that I think sometimes we can forget, A, the need for community to help it's us huge. see our blind spots and, every, and everything else, and then B, the need for preparation. So what happens is we sort of launch these half-baked ideas into the world or Absolutely. say things online or even say things publicly that have just, oh, well, God put it on my heart. And it's like, well, you know, God, God gave you community and people around you to help you help you make this make sense, yeah. you know? And yeah. when we lose that, something significant is lost. So, yeah. man, that's so good. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for sure. being with us today. Thank you for just sharing your insight and your wisdom and for for the risks that you were willing to take sure. and the stuff you were able to do to, to impact our community. It is, it is super inspiring. Thank you, Lance, as always, for being on the show. And thank you for those of you who are listening. Boy, oh boy, did we cover a lot of ground today, talked about a lot of interesting stuff. Hope that you were inspired. Hope that you're equipped and hope that you can continue to move forward with the dreams that God has laid on your heart to positively impact the kingdom and those around you. So thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of Engaging Culture. Thank you for listening to Engaging Culture, a podcast by Bridgeway Christian Church. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. Music is used under the Creative Commons license and is provided by Dexter Britton.